introduce Anthropocene Climate Change Contagion Consolation. This session is presented by Hero Future Energies. So Deep Sen's acclaimed new book, Anthropocene Climate Change Contagion Consolation is a literary and artistic response to the most urgent issues facing humanity, climate change and the pandemic. He tackles their complexities with honesty, sensitivity, and without compromise. Engaging with multiple genres, the book interrogates our lives against the backdrop of a dangerously fraught and ever-changing landscape on levels, emotional, physical, micro, and macro. It's a plea for positivity and prayer. Sen joins acclaimed poets Ranjit Hoskote and Ruth Padel, a session exploring urgent pervading themes and their effects on the public and private spheres and genre defying responses to a precarious present.
Sarovar, Mount Kailash. Frayed, flapping in the high winds, prayer flags gently unravel. Homage to the day's first light. But today the dawn is not as bright, though heavy, brooding, silver gray like the lake's shimmering glass top. No one is here except for a woman staring far away, wrapped in her sanctity of continuous linen, her own sari like a prayer flag, though devoid of any color. She isn't mourning or crying, just gazing fixedly into the water's changing glimmer as the sky's wet weight and the shore's rocky line meet their edges meanderingly melting into the lake itself. I stood far behind her, behind everything she saw. She was only an accidental figure in the widescreen frame. Unlike her, I was looking skywards through the prayer flag's translucent cotton, counting each thread of each piece of cloth that wove private stories whispered only to me. Weather-worn, strung across canted multiple horizons, I tried to map their own geographies, each an island, each with its own terrain, texture, inscription, and scripture found on the highest points on land, as close to the sky as is possible, these magic carpets, shapes caught on an unintentional clothesline, were more meaningful to me than this vast monastic scenery. How each flag, each one must have preserved secrets that only their owners knew how each a talisman exuded safety and calm, shrouding away grief for the briefest while when one forgets everything, real, imagined, and just dreams. My own piece of cloth that I once tied onto this line wasn't visible to me now. But that did not matter. I found strength in this procession of private passion, in these flags, lack of starch or hierarchy. Their stories passed down by one flag to another, toggled hand in hand through time and age. Just like my pet yellow butterfly who infused each flower in my garden with the gift of life without any show or fair. I like the transparent quiet here. I also like the wind's occasional sound, its severe current tearing through the flag's heart, picking out the perfect pitch and melody. A memory now, a still, framed, not revealing to the world what I had once seen. The panorama's generosity, its wild, stark untouchability, how each story stitched and preserved like the jewel in the lotus, its crystal fine edges caressed by petal soft skin, until everything folds inward like a fetus in a womb, a toppled, misplaced comma, my own implanted memory. And then they bloom, fanning outward, each 
flag, strand, story, each private grief and pleasure chanting noiselessly in the mountain's silent winds. Good afternoon, lovely to see all of you. It's been a long, long time. It's been what, three years since we've been on stage. So it's wonderful to have a tactile relationship. And uh, this is a poem from the book. Uh, I just played you these because uh, I work collaboratively with dancers and musicians and filmmakers. So I just thought it'd be lovely for you to see this. Uh, this is a poem from the book which we are talking about Anthropocene and this one's called Disembodied. It's uh, set in my home city of Delhi, but it's largely could be anywhere in the world. Disembodied. My body carved from abandoned bricks of a ruined temple, from minaret shards of an old mosque, from slate remnants of a medieval church apse, from soil tilled by my ancestors. My bones don't fit together correctly as they should. The searing ultraviolet light from Aurora Borealis patches and etch corrects my orientation. Magnetic pulses prove potent. My flesh sculpted from the fruits of the tropics, blood from coconut water, skin colored by brown bark of Indian teak, my lungs fueled by Delhi's insidious toxic air, echo asthmatic sounds, a new vinyl dub remix. Our universe where radiation germinates from human follies, where contamination persists from mistrust, where pleasures of sex are merely a sport where everything is ambition, everything is desire, everything is nothing, nothing and everything. White light everywhere, but no one can recognize its hue. No one knows that there's color in it, all possible colors. Body worshiped, not for its blessing, but its contour, artificial shape shaped by Nautilus, skin moistened by L'Oreal and not by season's first rains, skeleton strength not shaped by earthquakes or slow molded by fearless forest fires. Ice caps are rapidly melting, too fast to arrest glacial slide. In the near future, there will be no water left or too much water that is undrinkable, excess water that will drown us all. Disembodied floats afloat like Noah's Ark. No GPS, no pole star navigation, no fossil fuel to burn away, just maps with empty grids and names of places that might exist. Already, there's too much traffic on the road. Unpeopled hollow metal shells without brakes swerve about, directionless, looking for an elusive compass. So the book, of course, is about climate change, pandemic and consolation, but it was very, very important for me that the book ends in the note of hope, uh, a strain of positivity, because without hope, without light, we can't possibly go on. So the latter part of the book is about that. And I read one more poem. And this one's called Language. And the way language is now twisted politically, cancel culture and so on and so forth, the way the polit politi politicians spin language and so on. But it is our essential tool. We cannot possibly do without language. 
And it's partly about that, partly it's an ode to my first typewriter, which my grandfather gifted me. Um, and it's simply called Language. And it has a epigraph from Italo Calvino. And I quote, without translation, I would be limited to the borders of my own country. The translator is my most important ally. My typewriter is multilingual, its keys mysteriously calibrating my bipolar forked tongue. Black red silk ribbons pools unwind as the carriage moves right to left. In cursive hand, I write from left to right. My tongue was born promiscuous, speaking in many languages. My heart spoke another, my head yet another, the translation seamless. Oracles, ventricles pump blood. Capacel-like alphabets, phrases, syntax, cross-fertilize my text, breathing life. Texture enriched, music, cadence, spatially enhanced, osmotic, polyglottal, a polygamy of grammar. Letter forms, dance, ligatures, pirouette, ascenders, descenders, pitch perfect. Imagination isn't caged in speech. Speech cannot be caged in language. Thank you. Yes. Yes. So um, I'm delighted to engage with this a little bit and to help give you all a glimpse of, of what's inside it. It's a very rich book covering a lot of different aspects of the climate crisis, the, the crisis in nature, the crisis in the environment. But there are a lot of oppositions in it. And there's prose and poetry. And um, there's also, you, you read a poem, Disembodied, but there's a lot of embodiment. And one of the poems I found very moving is about asthma. I think you, you must have asthma. Yes, and um, a friend of mine had asthma and he said once, Ruth, having bad asthma is like you need oxygen, but the very thing you need is poison to you. And I thought that was, would you like to talk a little bit about that? It seemed to enshrine the whole planet in your own body. Yes, I think, you know, the, the, the fact that I also suffer from asthma just made me realize physically that it's not only in the best of times it's a difficult thing to breathe but with the pandemic with the politics all around us with the right wing complete madness um, we are in a situation that we are being choked politically ideologically uh, uh, spiritually in every possible way uh, the oxygen is to me a metaphor for life of course it is a metaphor for breathing and for sustenance but in a sense that something like the sword which Gandhi said that it should be free and it should be everybody's property until the British added a tax on it similarly the corporates and the right wing uh, set up are taxing the oxygen in a very kind of oblique way by containing it in cylinders and selling it by channeling it in a way that it is not accessible to normal people. So partly it's all about just that, the politics of air, the politics of breathing, the politics of uh, just existence, really. What appeals to me about this book also, Shadeep, is uh, as uh, I see that's also something, Ruth, you respond to, the fact that it's uh, it's composed on the principle of montage. It's 
there's your own poetry, there's the work you've done in translation, it's polyphonic in that sense. But also what struck me when I first read it is that you're setting forth on an almost impossible project. You, there's at one level, Anthropocene, your book, is an attempt to, to, to write a kind of Ritu Samhara, a cycle of the seasons, like Kalidasas, for instance. But how do you write a cycle of the seasons in the moment of climate catastrophe when the seasons have broken down? So could I draw you out on, on that sort of, I'm, I'm not going to call it a formal challenge because it's a deeply experiential challenge for us and yet to move towards form making. No, I think you, I, th I think you put it really beautifully. I think it, it, is, it is actually a formal challenge. So therefore you sort of dispense with uh, the genre uh, border, borders. Uh, I mean, I would have normally just written poetry and just published it as a poetry book, but this demanded uh, kind of breakages and le leakages and spillages because that's what's happening around us. So prose seeps into poetry, poetry seeps into sort of uh, meditative uh, uh, reportage. Uh, um, the first two months, uh, many of us are very privileged. I have a terrace on top of my house and the first two months, the only place I could go out unmasked was on my terrace. And it was wonderful. It was the childhood of uh, the Delhi of my childhood that returned. You know, the skies were bluer, the birds returned. We were actually communicating across the terraces like we used to do as children, almost with that. Remember, if you remember the matchbox with the string, you know. Um, so it was almost like getting a, a sense of utopia back, but except that it's not, it's, 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 it's hazardously dangerous. Uh, while the skies were blue, the AI, AQI of Delhi was hovering at 549, which is just the irony of the whole thing. So yes, it's not just experiential, but also I was trying to push the formal limits by using these kinds of genre breakages and fusing it back in a different way. Uh, but also it's a spiritual quest. It was as much a, a, a process of discovery and a process, process of healing for me as it was about writing it. Because we all needed healing. 12 of my friends perished during the pandemic. Um, and that's why the second half of the book is really about hope and light. I will, the, the book ends with one of my favorite Eastern European poets, uh, Cheslav Milos. And I book end the uh, book with this quote, and I have to read this because this was like my mantra. And I just quote, uh, Milos says, my generation was lost, cities too, and nations. But all this a little later. Meanwhile, in the window, a swallow. So it's these beautiful little things that make you live, that make you want to embrace, that make you want to hug. I think the more tactile we become, the better off as human beings we will be because we've become so super sophisticated and erudite that we keep distances. Before we make a phone call, we send five text messages. How ironic and ridiculous is that? You should be able to pick up the phone. So it's about so many things that we are all grappling with. And at one level, as an artist, as a poet, we are very privileged that we can use our tool, the trade in this case, poetry or whatever, to, to, to further that really. But it was a process. I learned along the way as much as I, you know, but one of one of the um, parts of speech I noticed you use a lot is the adverb, and I was thinking that perhaps that is a, a way of a way of characterizing a process. Only a fantastically wise and formal poet like Ruth Padel would pick on that, <laughs> and I'm sure Ranjit has picked on the other formal aspects. It was a conscious decision. Yes, yes. It was just a trope in a way, because you have to disguise a lot of things and you're trying to push a certain kind of narrative forward. So how do you use uh, the wonderful dictionary and of grammar and all the tools that we have in our possession? How do you recalibrate 
remodulate and rearrange them like Roman phalanxes, you know, for a new kind of war that we are engaged in. And the phalanxes for us is the mask. Even without the mask, we as human beings, we as modern men and women have such masked existence. We have a masked self, we have a masked self on stage, we have another self when we are an audience member, we are something with our husbands and wives, with our children. So part of it was adverbially, I wanted to you know, navigate that space. I, I want to touch on another aspect of the book, uh, literally the way the book was made. And I find this interesting because I lead a life that's, you know, that's partly in the world of literature and partly in the visual arts. And uh, often I've found these two things. I found myself keeping them apart for no good reason. And I'm very happy to see, for instance, in, in your book, you bring together the work you've done in photography or your response to, to the visual arts comes in and becomes part of the book. It's also thinking of, uh, yes, uh, no, another one. <laughs> Also, was thinking of Amitabh's, Amitabh Kumar's new book, The Blue, yes. Jur Blue Journal, um, um, and um, how he brings together his diary as well as the, the paintings he's been and drawings that he's been doing. I find this convergence interesting, and uh, I just want to draw you out on that. Did you, did you feel that that was done under against a certain pressure to keep these things apart, or it, does it look forward to a new audience that includes both readers and viewers? To tell you really honestly, I wasn't really thinking about the audience when I set it out. I mean, in a, it's in an odd kind of way, and it doesn't sound right if I say this, the book was a gift of the pandemic to me. There was so much uh, destruction and you know negativity all around, but I got something positive back in terms of creativity and the book. You know, as you know, side B of my life is as a photographer. And so the way I... Uh, the reason the photographs are there is partly because it was the month on the terrace where I would photograph everything. And I used the same uh, 16 by nine aspect ratio, the same tree and the skyscape changing over a month. And how the same frame, if you, even if you keep the camera static, nature does all the filtering and the saturation and the contrast ratios for you. These are untouched pictures. And they're so varied, it all depends on the STP, the standard temperature and pressure around us, the geological and geographical forces around you, the sky. Of course, pollution makes pictures prettier. Ironically, as you know, the sunsets are more ruddy and orange because of the particulate matter in the, in the system. So uh, in a sense, it brings in a lot of uh, different sides of my artistic uh, persona, so to speak, together. Uh, I was very, very lucky that uh, the publisher was willing to run with it because, as you know, a moment you put color photography in a book, the price of the book jumps manifold, <laughs> just one format. So I was told, keep it within eight or 16, and publishers and designers here would know that one form, which is one sheet, works in 16 pages. So if, you, if I had the 17th photograph, the price would have gone up. So, uh, so there's all that, but yes, the, the, the way the, um, the, the typography is arranged, the white spaces around the ink spaces are equally important for me because I think a lot of the books, especially in India are overcrowded. They are too textually dense and heavy. And I think it's important for the page to breathe. And the only way you can do it is use the right kind of typeface and uh, typography. And also the way you arrange things on the page without any gimmicks. So it should show, it should appear classy and untouched, but there's a lot of thought that goes, goes behind it. And as you know, as a curator and artist, uh, you know, that little square frame or the rectangle frame, a lot of things are going on inside and outside of it. Yeah. Finally, I just wanted to ask you, what does the, the falling leaf mean to you? The, these leaves on the front, the leaves on the back, are we all falling leaves? It's fallen leaves outside my window. <laughs> no, it's partly, it's, it's an ode to that. No, no. 
the, 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 the photograph itself was taken by me. And a wonderful little thing happened. It was an old poetry book of my grandfather. So I was dusting, you know, we'd have to dust things in, in India because every, every day, if you don't dust your house twice, then there's a film of beautiful filter called this camel gray color called finely granulated dust. So I was dusting my books and this old, one of the books, this, these, these leaves fell out, these pressings. And it just reminded me of the time my grandfather gave me the book. It was, I was on a walk and this is a people tree. This was in, uh, in Bakura in Bengal. And it, it dates back way back. So then basically I just took those leaves and photographed them. And one of the options I, I mean, I just sent it to the publisher and eventually he used this as the cover and I'm very happy. Also partly because I wanted it very, very minimalist because there were some very um, uh, beautiful, but um, overly stylized versions I saw. I just wanted some clarity and purity and also draw the, bring out the bleakness that we are going through. And the fact that these particular leaves have a serrated see-through filigree kind of gauze effect is the fact that our lungs are carboned and got holes. So part of it was reflective of that. But you know, as artists and critics and anthologizers and so on, we can speak on anything and make it sound very intelligent. But at the core of it, it was an emotional choice. It was to link the story of my childhood village, grandfather, the old book of poems I was reading, and the fact that the leaves ac accidentally fell off and gave new life and blessed my new book. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So Lovely much. to Thank see so many friends. Have a safe next year and keep your neighbors safe as well. Thank you, Sudeep Sen, Ranjit Hoskote, and Ruth Padel. We'd also like to thank Hero Future Energies for their support.